Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel, nice to see you again. Today we're doing an update on the Discus Breeding Project. And, well, they've been prolific. So far we've talked about how to set up the tank, I'll link the video for the first part of this series. Um, but they've been laying eggs every 7 to 10 days. Um, in the last video I, I think I joked about not being entirely sure whether these were the right two discus, because I had two discus laying prolifically in the display tank regularly. So I picked those ones and moved them into their own tank in the last video, that was fine. And they did lay eggs pretty quickly after that, but nothing happened, the eggs turned white so they weren't fertilised, so I was a bit like, oh, have I moved the wrong ones, have I picked two females, what's happened here? And they have laid three or four times now since then, and it's always been the same result where the eggs have turned white. After the first day, if the eggs don't darken, you can generally tell that they've not been fertilised. But on this attempt, we have some big news. So as you might be able to see, they are guarding some wrigglers. So we are on day two, maybe three, since they laid their eggs. And if you can see, kind of centre left of frame there, there's a bunch of white ones with some fungus on them. That's where they originally laid all the eggs. And today, they picked up all the ones that were viable and moved them around a bit to get away from the fungus. And we've talked about it before where I said we could add things like methylene blue which would help prevent the bad eggs fungusing over but I said I was going to leave the fish to do it because they know what they're doing. And they have. So they've picked up all the good ones and moved them around and if you can see in frame there that's why we call them wrigglers because they are wriggling. So that is fertilised eggs. This is the first good stage. Um, what we will see now is the fish will constantly fan these eggs and what they're doing there is trying to get fresh water over the eggs making sure that they don't go bad basically and keeping the water movement and keeping the eggs fresh and healthy. The ones that you can see on the bottom left there, they are the unfertilised ones. Uh, that's the, the easiest thing is that they go white um, and then if they get left alone you can start to see a bit of fungus growing on one of them. So sometimes they go in and they eat them, sometimes they just move the good eggs away and that's what they've done in this case. So, exciting times, we just need to wait now, that's the next thing. If we consider the timeline here, if we call day one the day that they lay the eggs, it's usually day two or three that you'll see them start to wriggle and they'll get into that next stage. They will stay attached to the cone for another four to six days after that. So every pair is, in my experience anyway, which is limited, every pair is different and the timings differ a little bit, but kind of around a week they'll be starting to leave the cone and hopefully the parents will then gather them in. And when they gather them in, what they're doing is getting themselves ready to be able to feed the fry that come off them and the, the fry will feed off the parents. You'll often see pictures of like swarms. Um, almost going round and they will, they'll take bits off the slime coat of the parents and that's what will sustain them for the first few days. Maybe another four or five days after that, again that timing can vary, is when you want to start thinking about feeding them because when you leave them too long they start to take lumps out of the, <laughs> the parents and you don't want that because you won't want the condition to drop in your breeding pair. So it's time now, I think, to start preparing your brine shrimp cultures. Um, I've had great success feeding with brine shrimp and with decapsulated brine shrimp eggs. It's usually what I'll use as the food. I'll feed them while they are feeding off the parents because it'll take them a while to get used to it and they do need multiple feedings so we're talking three, four, five times a day. Um, and once you know that they're readily feeding off that, that might be time to move them into their own fry raising tank. The reason I say make the brine shrimp now, because we're still a good few days away from it, is for me anyway, um, it's a bit like making pancakes. The first couple of times are always a bit rubbish. So I like to remind myself to dial in my brine shrimp making methodology. And all the fish in here, so if it works first time, great, all the fish in here will readily eat the brine shrimp. So I go four tablespoons of salt, one tablespoon of brine shrimp into my little hatchery here. Uh, leave that running and we'll come back and see how that does tomorrow. So now, like much of this process, we wait. And I think that's the biggest tip I could probably give with this is it is a waiting game. Now that we've got to the regular stage, that doesn't mean that this is going to be successful. 
I may come down later on this afternoon and I'll have eaten them all because I've stood in front of the tank too much. It's a very iterative process where you need to learn what your pair in particular is like and what they will tolerate and what they won't tolerate. Editor Graham here, uh, I just wanted to take this chance to remind you that we're currently fundraising for two great causes by selling calendars. Um, you can go on my website aquariumadventures.co.uk and have a look there. You can buy a digital or a physical calendar if you live in the UK, digital anywhere else. Or you can just donate money if you want. Two great causes. We've got the Freshwater Life Project and we've got the Amazon Research Centre for Ornamental Fishes, which is a bit of a mouthful to say. But I will leave links in the description where you can read up about both of these projects and see that they are fantastic projects and worthy of a little donation. And you get something for it as well. You get a calendar full of fishy pictures from myself and a bunch of my subscribers who submitted the pictures. So links in the descriptions. Okay, thank you. Bye. A potential pitfall that I've made when I've been setting up this tank. Um, my epic forethought has caught me again. So you see all this stuff in the back here. So this is the filter media, sponges and things like that. Um, it's a kind of internal sump system where it goes down, the water goes back up there and circulates around. Perfectly fine for filtration, but the fact that it's dark in colour might be an issue because when the fish do go free swimming, they're kind of genetically predisposed to search out dark things because their parents will go dark and their slime coats will become slimier and heavier and they will darken in colour and that's how the fry will find the parents to start feeding off them. So yeah, epic forethought of not changing this media out, that might attract them. So we'll need to see how it goes because I've had it in the past both ways where Sometimes I've had to take out, when I've been using sponge filters, had to take out the black sponge filter or wrap it in white floss just so it doesn't confuse the fry and sometimes the fry just don't care. So we'll have to play it by ear a little bit just to see whether that does cause us a problem or not. But yeah, I could have got ahead of the game and changed that before we started and then that wouldn't have been an issue but I don't think that far ahead in the future. Also a word on water changing and things like that. I generally do continue to do water changes if I need to, but I think the more important thing is to monitor the water parameters. Um, so I might spook the fish by doing a water change and when you spook them they go away and they eat all the, the eggs. Or I might let the water go so bad that that affects the eggs. So you have to be able to draw that balance, which is why it's kind of important to have a mature tank and mature filter um, so you don't need to water change every day if you don't have to. Um, the fact that there's algae on the sides of the tank, I'm really not bothered about that whatsoever. It's not a bad thing necessarily, it might be unsightly, but it doesn't affect the water quality. But as soon as the fry start free swimming, it's probably when I'll start doing water changes again. So I want to make sure that it can go a week without a water change, which it can. Um, water changes is a good way to stimulate breeding but once you've got the eggs in there I kind of want to keep everything as stable as possible and spook them as little as possible really. So it's probably important to realise that I'm doing this as a let the fish lead the way. If I was trying to maximise yields and get the, the greatest, fastest mass production of babies out of this, this isn't the way to do it. Um, this is me just letting the fish take the lead and see what happens. So we may well go through this many more times. I wanted to make the video and give you a bit of a catch up of to what was happening. Of all the posts on in the olden days when everyone was using forums and everything, it was always, oh my discus, I've tried five times and they just keep eating it. I've had them go 50 times. <laughs> it, it, it takes time, you just got to let them go for it. Uh, and like I say, learn what your particular pair is going to be like as parents. Um, they might be terrible parents, they might wait till they go free swimming and decide I don't like this and just eat all the babies. So if you want to find out what this pair does, click that subscribe button and come back in the next one and hopefully I'll have some free swimming fry to show you. Thanks for watching, see you in the next one. Bye!